It's my great pleasure and privilege to introduce Vadi Ratner, who is something more than a survivor. She is a writer of the first order and has shared with us an extraordinary tale. Her family comes from the lineage of King Sisawath, is that right? Sisawath, yes. who ruled Cambodia in the early part of the 20th century. In 1970, her father's first cousin led a coup that ended monarchical reign to establish a short-lived republic, soon engulfed in the broader Vietnam War. Once the Khmer Rouge took power, forcing the entire urban population into the countryside and to work camps, that royal name that once meant protection and comfort now mark them for death. For the next four years, her family endured forced labor, starvation, and near execution, and a train. During that, during that time, she lost most of her family, and only through their courage and tenacity did she and her mother escape, later settling in the United States. She later graduated from, uh, with, without any English, by the way, she later graduated as her high school valedictorian and as summa cum laude graduate of Cornell University where she specialized in Southeast Asian history and literature at Cornell, which is one of the finest uh, universities for that field. In the shadow of the Banyan draws upon her personal experiences during those four years. And she's transformed it, that experience, into a work of art through her remarkable imagination. Banyan has been adored by critics and audiences alike, and was selected as a finalist for both the 2013 Penn Hemingway Award and the 2013 Indies Choice Book of the Year, and it will be published in 19 languages. And you can see her today, and you can see her again at the National Book Festival uh, this September. My, uh, I, I don't, I couldn't have come up with a better introduction than this quote from the Qu Christian Science Monitor review, in the shadow of the Banyan, offers a child's eyewitness account to Cambodia's genocide, overlaid by the soul of a poet. She is indeed a poet and a writer, as I say, of the first order. She'll be reading uh, briefly, and then we'll have a few questions, and then take questions from the audience. Ladies and gentlemen, Fatty Radner. Good morning. Can everyone hear me? Thank you all for coming on a very uh, cloudy Saturday morning um, uh, to, to this event. It just uh, goes to show that um, uh, here in Washington, D.C., in the D.C. area, we have a great um, I guess, uh, support from our literary community. Thank you all so much. Um, again, my name is Bede Ratner. I um, will read uh, to you a short passage. Um, I've chosen um, uh, a pass this particular passage to illustrate the rich uh, cultural elements of, of the narrative, fitting the theme of our discussion. As Keith has said, um, in 1975, when the Khmer Rouge seized control of uh, Cambodia, the first thing they did was to evacuate the entire urban population to the countryside as part of the social um, engineering to transform the whole country into an agrarian society. Weeks um, into the mass exodus, Rami, my young protagonist and her family, arrive at a temple. Here, amidst the lovely surroundings, with her father beside her, the seven-year-old Rami senses that in their exiled home is still possible. 
that home is not constructed of walls and pillars alone, but of something more intangible. She begins to discover a home constructed of dreams and stories. So I'll begin the reading. It's so beautiful. It is, isn't it? Papa squeezed my hand. That's why I want you to see it. He let out a long, slow breath, adding to the vapor around us. It's a gift to be able to imagine heaven and a rebirth to actually glimpse it. Is this heaven then? I asked, blinking the last remnants of sleep, thinking perhaps I was still dreaming. At least it's mirror image. If one glimpses heaven's reflection on earth, then somewhere must exist the real thing. Papa's eyes went to the pair of carved serpents along the balustrades. The Naga, he said, from the Sanskrit Nagara for city or kingdom, is a symbol of divine energy, our link to the heaven. This place, this land of Naga pillars and steeples and spires was born of divine inspiration. So goes one legend among many. My favorite story is one of Malia, the son of Endra and his earthly consort. One day, the 12-year-old Malia receives an invitation from his father to visit him. Papa looked up and pointed at the carved image of a mythical creature, part human and part bird, adorning the top of every, of every pillar of the prayer hall. Perhaps on the wings of one of those, I like her to imagine, Malia ascends the heaven. It's Kinnara, I reminded him, of the creature's name. From the countless tales I read and heard about Kinnara, um, this bird could traverse back and forth between the world of the humans and that of the gods. Yes, that's right, Papa nodded, smiling. Once there, Malia gazes in awe at his father's celestial kingdom, the many-tiered steeple palaces covered with precious stones, moats and pools shimmering as if made of liquid diamonds, causeways and bridges stretching to eternity and back. You will have your own earthly kingdom, Endra says to his son, in the image of this one. Whatever you so desire here, I shall send my celestial architect to replicate it. Malia, moved by his father's generosity, dares not request a replica of Endra's own palace. Instead, he humbly asks to recreate only Endra's cattle stable. That's it, just the cattle stable? My mind was roused by the story. Baba chuckled. Ah, but even Endra's cattle stable gave rise to the great Angkor temple which became the inspiration for all later temples that adorn this land of your birth. You see, Rami, as beautiful as this temple is, it's only a tiny, modest glimpse of what is divinely possible in all of us. We are capable of extraordinary beauty if we dare to dream. I kept quiet, imagining Papa as Indra and myself, Malia. Do you know why I named you Watarami? He knelt down on me and looked into my eyes. Because you are my temple and my garden, my sacred ground, and in you I see all of my dreams. He smiled, as if allowing himself the indulgence of an early morning's pondering. Perhaps it's natural for a father, for every parent, to see in his child all that's unspoiled and good. But if you can, Drami, I want you to see it in yourself. No matter what ugliness and destruction you may witness around you, I want you always to believe that the tiniest glimpse of beauty here and there is a reflection of the God's abode. It is real, Drami. There exists such a place, such sacred space. You have only to envision it, to dare to dream it. It is within you, within all of us. He straightened up again, letting out another long breath. I see it all the time. It was clear. If I looked hard enough, 
if I sought, I would find what I was looking for. Here on the banyan shaded ground, the temple harbored minute reflections of the paradise we had left behind. Thank you. I'm going to throw away my first question and, and talk about what you just read. Uh, there's, there's so much going on in this book where, uh, you know, not only is it the story of this terrible experience of a family, but it's overlaid with this beautiful, these beautiful myths and legends from a culture that to most of us is quite foreign. And I was, I'm curious about what you and your, in the course of writing and your editor, how you decided to um, weave in these stories in such a way that we can all gain them as, a, as an American audience. Well, um, when I uh, sat down uh, to, to think uh, about this particular story, one of the things that kept coming back to me in the course of my life um, in America was the moment I mentioned the word Cambodia, um, the country Cambodia, the land Cambodia. I think often the very image that come uh, uh, that that came to people's mind was the killing fields, and so it's not only um, uh, you know a foreign place that I'm talking about um, that uh, I feel that uh, you know it's a foreign culture that 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 I'm venturing into. I feel it it's it was um, a a culture that too many people um, uh, disappeared, and and it did uh, during the Khmer Rouge. It was uh, the the society was uh, taken back to to the year zero. And uh, when I was approaching this story, what I wanted was to approach it in a way that I think would be most beneficial for um, the, not only Cambodians but for um, a wide audience in the sense of what if I were to take away uh, the preconceptions that we had of uh, that place, uh, Cambodia, as the killing fields. And in doing that, I had to um, uh, present it through um, the story through a very innocent uh, character, a character that had no um, preconceptions of, of, of the society, no um, a real knowledge of, of, of the history of, of the political drama at that time because I wanted the audience to to the audience to come to to this story in the same way um, and so when um, I guess uh, in terms of presenting it in a way now once I've made that decision and in terms of presenting it in a way that doesn't seem foreign is because perhaps um, in, in thinking it is that I don't look at it as the other culture. It's, it's, this is a culture that has been with me from the moment that I was born. I am basically translating it into a language that has come to me later. Um, so, and, um, so using the English language to really paint the emotional landscape for um, for my characters uh, to inhabit, as well as for my audience to enter into that, that, that narrative landscape. Right, and, and what happens over the course of it is that you recreate a whole, a whole new Cambodia for an American audience through re-enchanting that myth and making it come alive again. The, 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 sto the story uh, of Rami and her father and her mother, later her mother as well, sharing, sharing these myths and these stories um, for, I don't want to give away too much of the book, yes. but for, for strength. Yes. For, for continuity. Yes. yes for yeah. continuity. Um, you know, it's a... Uh, uh, I have uh, been asked often 
um, uh, whether my style is lyrical or poetic and, and so forth. And I don't really um, uh, query myself in that sense uh, when I write. But one of the things that I was conscious of when I was writing in the shadow of the banyan was um, presenting not only the, the, the landscape, the context uh, of uh, this narrative, um, in, uh, 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 as well as the language, in a way that would contrast what was going on at that time. When the Khmer Rouge came in, they uh, not only changed the landscape of the Cambodian society, but uh, they changed the way people speak. Um, they, uh, you know, Khmer is a very um, poetic language. It's based on Sanskrit, and um, that, you know, that that poetry within the language was completely uh, taken away and replaced by um, revolutionary jargons and and uh, and 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 the rhetoric and the slogans. Um, and I wanted. I was very conscious when I was writing to contrast all of that. And so this, the story, the myths and so forth was not only um, uh, an example of, of me wanting to show um, the power of, of stories um, uh, the, to, to transcend our experiences, but also to contrast the, the Khmer Rouge ideology of eliminating uh, people's history, eliminating an individual story that now uh, we are going back to year zero to, uh, to, to nothing and the only story that you will have and that you will carry with you is the story and the history of the revolution of the organization. And so I really want to, to contrast those two elements. And, and the organization becomes this, this force in the yes. book that's somewhat reminiscent of, of 1984 and uh, you know they they build this they dig this huge uh, trench yes. for seemingly no purpose at all uh, just to enforce the will of the state on the people and it's this great contrast that the third thing going on I think in addition to this this story about this this brutal uh, organization, and that's the way that Bade uh, talks about it in her book. And the myths of the Cambodian culture is the story of this individual family. And you know, one of the things that I think people take away from uh, Killing Fields and that whole image of Cambodia is it be somehow becomes so horrific that it loses uh, its individual nature. So talk a little bit about the family that is at the core, the, 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 the immediate family and then the uncle and the aunt and his family and, and how you conceive that that is a thread through, through the narrative. Yes. Um, well, you know, one of uh, the questions, uh, another uh, question that I, I was um, uh, often asked is, you know, your, your, your characters are so real. How do you do it? <laughs> and, um, uh, I, you know, my first reaction, well, well they are real, <laughs> you know. They, they, they were real people. They were based on my family members. But in writing it, I felt that um, uh, just because they were real to me and because I loved them and continue to uh, to, to love uh, those uh, who managed to survive and, and you know, continue to mourn um, those who um, did not. Um, I think it was really important for me to, um, uh, to honor, I feel, the, the spirits, whether um, it's of people who have uh, fallen victim to, to that experience or, uh, you know, made it out with me to 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 honor um, uh, those lives and and you know they were focused on um, my uh, you know family members but uh, aside from my father's uh, Rami's father uh, the character of Rami's father um, uh, who uh, whose name I, I, I maintain whose title I maintain um, 
you know, I collapse some of, of, of the characters together, or I uh, position, uh, reposition their order of, of birth and so forth. Um, so these are, you know, kind of the, the more the technical side of, of, of writing. But um, again, I don't want to go into too much detail uh, in terms of, of the characters and, and the family because some of you have not read the book. But what is, um, I think, the motivating feeling or um, endeavor uh, for this particular book and my reason for writing it as a work of fiction was because I wanted not, uh, I, I did not want to focus it on my life. A memoir would have come off that way. I really wanted to honor uh, the lives of, um, of, of, of family members, in particular those who were silenced. Um, and so my, my whole narrative was focused on telling their stories, their aspirations, their, their struggles, their fear. Um, for example, um, uh, Rami's father, uh, who um, faces a very uh, difficult choice in the book because of who he was. He was not only um, uh, you know, an educated man, uh, you know, a, a, sc a scholar, he's not only a scholar, an educated man, a poet, but he came from uh, a family um, that uh, caused a lot of um, the injustice and perpetuate the injustice of a Cambodian society. Um, this was the royal family. And, and you know, to, to confront um, uh, that uh, that war, that revolution, and seeing uh, and and see himself personally responsible for perhaps um, uh, the wrongs of, of his society. So that's that's one of the things that that um, I try to address. And you know, I don't think it's particular to Cambodia in that sense. And every uh, element that I um, present in the book, I try to reach beyond politics and culture and put it as an individual human struggle, put a really personal face on it. And, and, and it's certainly one of the strengths of the book that, uh, you know, I mean, we could talk endlessly about parallels between real life and the story, but this is a work of art. This is a, a, this is a work of arrangement, of details and putting things in, in the right order. And a lot of the, a lot of, I think, the success of the book, the success of the story, is the flow of the narrative. It starts out in this, uh, you know, pretty idyllic uh, life that the, the narrator has, or the, the, the protagonist has. And then, you, over the course of the novel, less and less, more loss and more loss, and yet it's leavened by some wonderful characters. I'm thinking of the, the couple who sort of adopt yes, yes. the family, and they, they bring, in the midst of this unimaginable tragedy, they bring sort of lightness and comedy and, and so forth. So, I, I'm not sure I have a question there, but, yes. but I, it's one of the things I wanted to, to let you know how much I admire. Well, the, the old couple in the story, um, for those of you who are familiar with the book and those um, of you who haven't read it, uh, to keep an eye out for them a little bit, they, I think out of all the characters, even though I was very close to my father, he was one of the most difficult characters to, to, to render because perhaps he was so close and every time I approached his um, uh, character in the beginning uh, of my writing process and through the end, I had a, a breakdown. It, it was very, very difficult. But um, the old couple was really, really wonderful to write. I feel that um, I basically uh, translated them into another language, um, that they were as, um, 
in, in, in the book, uh, they are in the book as they were in, in real life. Um, so they, they were wonderful that way. But you know, you touch on the aspect of humanity amid atrocity. This is something that um, uh, I try very, very hard to articulate. I think um, what I find, you know, the, I, I'm sure you uh, feel this way at, at some point. Um, when you turn on the television, when you log on to the internet and read the news or um, open the newspaper, all you see uh, sometimes you feel like it's just one tragedy af after another. And you do, um, you know, begin to ask, you know, will people ever learn? Will we ever learn? And I think um, I ask those, uh, that particular question as well. But having survived, I cannot escape the feeling of being just so grateful and 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 uh, you know I, I guess I feel that I live my life in a way that I'm uh, that is that is a reminder in the sense of that without the kindness um, of people like the old couple without them intervening or having the courage to do the smallest thing and having the biggest effect I would not be be here uh, be you know having the life that I have now and so I think um, I feel that the voice of atrocity is so audible and if I have an opportunity somehow to go up against that voice I want to increase to augment the voice of humanity. And that's what uh, In the Shadow of the Banyan is about. For me, it's about augmenting the voice of humanity and lessen, not the effect, but lessen the voice of atrocity. You know, I, 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 I think so the, the tragedy about atrocities like the Khmer Rouge, atrocities that we continue to witness is that you know, when it has happened, you cannot lessen the effect of it. You know, the um, and both in terms of its weight, its gravity, as well as in terms of the the its uh, its endurance, how long it continues to to affect a society. Cambodia is still very much trying to recover from that tragedy and continue to live within the shadow of 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 uh, you know of that tragedy. I I want to. Before we turn it over to the audience, I want to uh, talk a little bit about some of those characters that you that you say, you know, are the face, the human face against the atrocity and and the two the relationship between the mother and the daughter, and the father and the daughter. I, I can see that how yeah. how you you know would struggle with that yeah. and uh, the mother and the daughter, the daughter who who is a just a small child I mean and she ha feels tremendous guilt uh, could you talk a little bit about the, the mother and the daughter yes um, you know uh, I think um, the, the, the second character uh, the, the, the second hardest character in the book was, was the mother and in some way actually she was harder uh, to, to write uh, to render uh, than the father uh, in the sense of um, she's based on um, my mother, and my mother is still alive. It's, um, it, it's you, um, you see the imperfections of, of those who continue to, to be with you. And, and in some way, it's, it's hard, you know, it's easier, I feel, um, uh, to mourn those who are truly gone because you can place them somewhere. But those who continue to be with us, they are living in, um, in every sense, and yet you see aspects of their broken self, their selves, um, uh, aspects that have, uh, that, that have been destroyed. And, and while you live with them, you also mourn this living person. And so um, uh, she, uh, the mother character was, was excruciating to, um, to render. I actually um, didn't want uh, to, um, uh, to really go much into her character 
when I finished the, the novel, it was um, uh, close to 700 pages. And <laughs> I, and I thought, okay, okay, I, I'll, I'll still have a few months. You know, nobody's going to be interested in reading this right away, if, even if I sent it out to, um, you know, literary agents and trying to find, um, you know, got one to, uh, who would be interested. It would be months. Um, but then, uh, you know, in a couple of months, I, uh, you know, I had this realization that I'm not Salman Rushdie in the sense of I cannot get away with a 700 pages manuscript. <laughs> so, you know, nobody's going to read me. And so I had to, to really discipline myself to cut down. And I managed to uh, cut down the manuscript to 400 pages. Um, and then uh, I met uh, my literary agent. I, you know, she uh, got contact. I can go into this in more detail if, if you like. But uh, to make a long story short, um, uh, we really clicked and she wanted to sign me on. And then she said, I could submit this tomorrow, but I would like you to do one thing. I would like you to cut this one character, and I knew, going into the meeting, I knew who I had to cut. And it just broke my heart, and it's about 60 pages, more than 60 pages long, this character. And what she said was, um, and this is our first meeting with each other, you know, we've been communicating by phone and so forth. Um, she said, not because I did not love him, this character, he's amazing, he's very seductive, but he usurps the mother character. And I think you need to come back to the mother character. And I start tearing up. I said, I can't, you know, I, I can't do that. And, um, but even as I said it, um, I realized that the reason um, I brought this character in was because I could not face rendering the mother character because she was so powerful and I was afraid that if I brought her in and focused the second half of the book on her and I failed, I have this living person to contend with, <laughs> you know. And, um, but when my mother, after my mother read the book, she called me up. Two things that she said that just completely reduced me to that seven-year-old child again. She said, I did not know that you carried that child with you for 30 years. And if I were to write a book about this story, this is the book that I would have written. And so it was, it was uh, for me, I felt like, no, she did not say, yes, you did it, you succeeded, but I felt like that was her telling me that I have um, done the memory uh, justice. Thank you. Uh, we have time for a few questions from the audience. Yes. 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 You know what? Uh, he's on actually the internet now. I just did um, a short piece. It's only 800 words. <laughs> um, uh, the character, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's um, the, the piece that you can look up um, is called the, Cripple, the Cripple's Last Dance. Um, there was a, um, a g when we were taken to this one town during the Khmer Rouge period, I came to know this man who was paralyzed from the waist down. And we looked at each other. Even though we didn't say anything, the question that went back and forth silently was, how did you survive this long, <laughs> you know? And, and I felt that he was, very as, he was very instrumental in terms of helping me to survive, especially in uh, the context of me having this um, uh, uncle who was like a giant, who seemed so invincible to me, and then to see what the revolution did to him, and then having this uh, man in my life now, uh, we were left behind at this particular town because we were handy. Both, both of us were handicapped, uh, you know, in in some way. And that's um, you know, I had polio as a child, as Rami um, uh, did. Um, 
And my, I think my friendship with him, what stuck with me was that survival does not have to depend on my physical stature. That survival began somewhere up here and in here, and that I have to find a way to somehow access that. And it wasn't so much accessing uh, um, a part of me that was, was, um, that was strong, that was invincible. It was actually locking it, locking the child, the innocence, the belief in humanity, and not let anything of that time, of any um, uh, events, uh, invade that. And so what I did learning from that character was to find a place and unlock the child that, that I was inside. Um, the person that was forced to grow up under that circumstances. Yeah, uh, oh, a quick. Very privileged to meet you. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, there you go. Uh, very privileged to meet you. Um, you you just now um, uh, touched upon how you consciously and uh, through technical writing you uh, tried try to present uh, a positive and uplifting image. Yes. And it's very poetical, it's very lyrical. Um, and so when I read the book, un unlike um, A Night, uh, where very similar things happened, but it's very graphic, it uh, talks about inhumanity, and very similar things happened with you, but what I get is the lyrical aspect. Now, in, in your real life, I know you wrote it to overcome. In your real life, do you surround yourself with beauty, poetry, art, um, music, and family? Do you encourage your children? You, I think you have a daughter. Uh, is that something you consciously do every time to overcome that life that you I'm not have? sure whether it, it, it's at this point in my life. Uh, thank you for asking that. Um, I'm not sure whether it's, it's conscious in the sense of I'm aware of it, you know, I'm um, or, you know, that it's, it's um, something that I set out and say, okay, today I'm going to be this smiling person and so forth. But I remember this, um, uh, this uh, one kind of um, a, a type of cultivation that my, my father had with me the first five years of my life. Uh, um, you know, I had polio when I was one, and so I had always um, lived with this handicap before I even was aware of it. But I think he must have been aware of the kind of society that I was born into, being a woman, and you know, into the royal family, where so much emphasis is, is, is put um, on your physical beauty, your physical perfection. And what my father did when I was young, everywhere I went with him, he would point out to me what was beautiful. We could be standing in the middle of a, a marketplace and it's chaotic and it's smelly and it's, you know, it's, um, there's, uh, it's uh, uh, overcome with, uh, with garbage, with trash, or, you know, we c would go to the countryside and, you know, um, you, know you, you, you see, uh, um, a very poor, hardworking peasant. He, while he acknowledged that, he would explain, you know, people's lives to me. He would also point to me um, uh, the beauties that was around me, um, uh, the, uh, the, the, all the beauties that that you know that were ar around me. And, and so, I felt as a child uh, coming. I, I don't know whether it was so conscious, but. At some point, I must have realized that it is not so much, you know how in the West you're, you're taught to think beauty is from within. I think if I could contrast it just a little bit with, with the way my father um, sort of guided me in those first five years was that beauties exist all around you and sometimes your own beauty, your own courage will fail you. So you need to pay attention to what's around you so that you can borrow from that in times of need. And so, and so I think um, 
that was cultivated and uh, you know uh, into me uh, was uh, uh, impressed upon me and so I don't know whether um, I I'm conscious of it but I do feel that wherever I go I seek I, I hunger for for that glimpse of beauty and I look for it I s and I have never yet failed uh, uh, um, uh, to find it I, I have always found beauty whenever I look for it so if that makes sense Yeah, you know that our like uh, kind of like a writing question, not exactly related to your novel, but uh, it's kind of thinking that um, when you are writing, you know that uh, are you trying to driven by your Im imagination and then start from the scratch and then from chapter one, chapter two, go to the go to your final end, then come back to review it, revise it, or you kind of like uh, uh, comprehensive, you know. I call that me. I cannot do it. It's kind of like uh, you have a global view to see what you're going to rate, what characters, what kind of interactions, and then you start to write pieces and put them together, and then like a 3D print. So, and then you have like a global view, and then you manipulated them each part, and then y without touching your you know global picture too much. So, I guess you know everybody has his or her own view. I just want to see for your r writing, you know that. Uh, then how you write that, and then how how much part you create, you know, from the reality to vision or to your ultimate goal, and then how you're going to, you know, adapt them to the global picture you want to write them, which is different, a little bit different from their reality, right? Yeah. Well, I think you know. Let me let me try to answer um, uh, that. I guess query in in this way, um, the uh, storytelling has, I think, two processes. The first takes place in your head and your heart. You feel that you have a story to tell. You know, you think you have something to to say, and so and that keeps circulating in your head and you start to imagine dialogue and scene and so forth. Um, and I think all of us um, uh, experience, uh, you know, uh, experience that. You know, we, we see something and, and, and it becomes a story inside our head. But the process of writing a book is, is very different from the process of imagining a, a, a story. Writing a book, you need to make a technical decisions, um, uh, uh, techniques, you know, that uh, are related to, to the craft. For, um, and it's different for uh, every book. For this particular book, In the Shadow of the Banyan, it is based on my family's history. It's based on real historical events. Uh, so um, I have the, the, the narrative arc of from beginning to the end. Um, and, uh, you know, so I need to, go in writing it, I needed to make decisions um, on what, uh, what aspect of that experience, what events f fit into the, the, the themes um, that I want to, to, to address. And um, the themes for, for um, In the Shadow of the Banyan is, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's about, you know, it's, it's storytelling, uh, the, the power of, of, of stories to transcend our experience beyond politics, beyond culture, um, and uh, to transcend loss, um, in, uh, yeah, to, to transcend our loss. And I think, um, once you sit down to write, you can have all these different things in mind, and you can kind of come back to it. But to write a convincing story, at some point, you, the creator, have to kind of leave, in the sense, and allow the process of creating to take place, and to, for you to be guided, and for you yourself to kind of blend into the story so that 
you're not conscious anymore that, oh, I'm sitting here as a writer, I'm writing this, and I want this to be a universal you know, story. So I think um, at some point, uh, you come to realize that these characters are so real and you want to know what happened to them. Are they going to survive uh, this, uh, this ordeal? Are they, uh, 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 or, you know, how are they going to do it, you know? Uh, how, how is it all going to come out? You're so invested in it emotionally and intellectually that you forget that this is something that you're creating, but something that you're part of, actually, you're part of that journey. Does that answer your question? <laughs> We have one, time for one more quick one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what's your next book going to be about? <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, I, I'm going to try to make this as succinct as possible. Um, you know, and The Shadow of the Banyan addresses the questions of how do you survive an experience um, like this? You put in um, this great atrocity and, uh, and, and a child is forced to um, look within herself and around herself to draw whatever um, loveliness or beauty and really magnified it against this, this uh, very powerful uh, force uh, that is bent on annihilating her and her family, her country. Um, so the second book is about, well, you manage to uh, survive it. How do you contend with the shadow of such a tragedy? How do survivors move on and, um, and invest their life with a sense of purpose, with a sense of meaning? And so that's, um, that's uh, my second project. I, d I just want to say that uh, <coughs> Why you were reading this about the myth and about that man who was a half, half man, half bird? There was a man who walked by, who was all buffalo. <laughs> He's around here somewhere, and I take that as a sign yes. that you should buy this book. Go buy this book and read it, and you will be blown away. So thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you so much. You're very kind. Thank you.